back, Tom. Okay, recess is over. Recess is over. Sleep time. Is gone. Um, our next item is a public hearing in Article Number One, and uh, on the agenda here we have to take two hundred one seven to two hundred one seven. This is a local law to prevent uh, low assessments of converted condominiums pursuant to section 581 of the property tax law and section 339 of the real property law. And I have a motion and a second to open the public hearing. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, public hearing is open. Um, I think this one, Jeff and Denise, need to tell us what this is all about and why we're doing this. Which one of you would like to start? Okay. Thank you, Supervisor, Council, and members of the public. Um, I'm Denise Kamara, the assessor for the town of Ron. And as background on this local law, um, in the town because we are at 100% and adopted the Homestead tax classification. Anything that was built other than condo could be converted to condo and the tax classification would be non-homestead. What that means is in its valuation it would be valued based on the income approach as if it were an apartment building and the values of the individual units would be significantly less than being valued at market rate. So we have a su substantial number of condos valued at market rate, which is basically what they would be selling for, and then we have a handful of condos currently that are valued based on the income approach and their assessments are significantly less. So the law basically would preclude anybody in the future from taking, let's say, an apartment building um, or a small homeowners association attached or detached, converting it to condos and benefiting from their value being based on the income approach. And that's the general gist of it. Do you have anything to add that was the reason we're doing it, um, just two, two anecdotal matters. Um, the reason that we're doing it is if somebody said, well, don't you want to benefit the homeowners? Isn't that a good thing for them? And the answer for those homeowners, yes. But then the rest of the taxpayers of the town has to make up the difference. And I was actually approached by somebody at one point who, who mentioned that uh, they were a homeowners, uh, that, that a homeowners association approached them about doing it. And I said, well, I don't think that's going to happen in the town run because we're going to pass a law. So this is to benefit, even though they harm a few people, technically it's not going to really harm them because they're just going to continue to be taxed as they have been. And this is to benefit all of the taxpayers of the town of Ron. And, um, and that, that's basically that's the reason behind it. And this is, uh, just to be clear, this is not a special law only for the town of Ron. This is a, an option that the law provides that uh, communities, that towns can uh, avail themselves of. So we're not the only ones who have done this or will do this. As a matter of fact, uh, I go to a supervisor's uh, meeting every month, supervisors of all of the towns of Westchester, and uh, when I, I, we discuss issues, and I raised uh, the issue that, this issue that we were going to do this, everybody around the table looked at me and said, please send me a copy of your law, because everybody's facing this issue, so this is important. And hopefully, when, when, when after the certainly it passes, after you certify it, would you send me a comment? Sure. Thank you. Comments from the council? 
Can I ask it? Okay. Let's do the, the council first. Okay, I just want to say, uh, and reiterate what uh, the supervisor mentioned, and that this uh, this is in keeping with fairness and equity uh, when it comes to the uh, properties throughout the town of Rye, and, uh, and making sure that everybody pays their fair share. Thank you. Anybody else? Comments from the public? Any comments from the public? Um, uh, before we go, I hope this, this uh, notice was published in the newspaper. And, uh, it was published in the general news and also in the West Virginia. Thank you. Uh, motion to close the public hearing. So, back. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The hearing is closed. Um, bringing the uh, <coughs> matter to the floor. Um, motion uh, to pass local law number one of 2017. So, Second. Call the roll, please. Councilperson Jackson? Yes. Councilperson Martin? Yes. Councilperson Baxter? Yes. Councilperson Granola? Yes. And Supervisor Yes. Thank you. Uh, we are now on public hearing for local law number 2 of 2017. A local law established a sustainable energy law program in the town of July. I have a motion to open the public hearing. So, second. All in favor? Mm -hmm. Aye. Public hearing is open. Um, I think we have a short presentation from Mark. Okay. Tom, you want to introduce this to? Uh, sure, as Mark's coming up, um, I can certainly um, set the stage for this. Uh, we are members of Sustainable Westchester and they, in conjunction with uh, Mark's group, Energize New York, approached us uh, a month or so ago um, with a program that has been in place for some time uh, that the town of Rye is not yet a member of um, or has participated in, but we think it's uh, potentially an exciting opportunity for some of our commercial uh, property owners. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce Mark Teal King, who will introduce the program to us. Thank you. Thanks, Juan. Thank you, uh, Councilman and Councilpersons. Uh, yeah, my name is Boris. Okay, go here. So, uh, thanks again for inviting me back. Uh, my name is Mark Hilking. I'm the Executive Director of the Energy Improvement Corporation. We manage three services for our member municipalities, one of which is called Energize New York Case Financing. Uh, in addition, we have Energize New York Commercial and Energize New York Residential, which is supportive values that we provide to residents of our members for upgrades like the New York City for this building. So that actually was a very pleasing uh, to sit through the, the uh, discussion around the upgrades of this building to see exactly what we help residents do in our membership. Go to the next slide. So we are a local development corporation. We're a nonprofit. We're controlled by local governments around New York State that wish to offer these services to their residents. And our mission, as all local development corporations must have, is to see the building stock of a community improved for energy efficiency and renewable energy. Go to the next slide. Our board is made up of municipal officials, just like yourself, uh, because again, we're controlled by the local governments that wish to offer these services to their residents. You'll notice many uh, folks in here in Westchester County because we started right here in Westchester. Most of the towns of Westchester are our members now, and uh, we're now spreading across the state to see more and more uh, board members from the state. Next slide. This is the current uh, membership list. Anything in green or light green are members of the PIC, and the orange municipalities are ones that are considering membership. Go to the next slide. And this is how Westchester looks. You'll see a difference between Westchester and the rest of the state. That's because tax lien authority is held at the township level in Westchester, whereas in the rest of the state, our membership must consist of counties or cities because that's where tax lien authority is held. Currently, we uh, operate over, actually we cover over 50% of the population in New York State with our membership outside of New York City. So it's a pretty significant uh, group since the last time I spoke to you a couple years ago. Next slide. And these are the, the list of members. I won't dwell on this, but again, it's uh, a little over 52% of the population in New York State. Next slide. And these are the ones that are considering membership. Uh, next slide. So our services relate to offering uh, 
services for our membership, our municipalities, which includes uh, support related to the financing that is offered to local uh, commercial building owners as well as other profits. We also provide property owner support through energizing more commercial and residential. We've helped over 400 commercial and not-for-profit buildings move forward with upgrades since we started four years ago. And we've helped over 1,200 residential buildings uh, move forward with their upgrades as well. In addition, we provide services to contractors in the community to get them trained up on what these services provide to them so that they can create more jobs and more uh, revenue for themselves. Next slide. So what is the primary service, uh, service that we're offering is called case financing. And this is where, uh, under Article 5L of the General Municipal Law, where municipalities can provide the capital for the upgrades in commercial and residential buildings. And that capital is repaid back through a tax charge on that property. It's an extension of what you normally see for water improvements, and sewer improvements, sidewalk improvements. They've now, the New York State has extended that option to municipalities to provide capital for energy improvements that could be renewable as well as efficiency. So the building, that uh, this building in particular, if you're considering it's a commercially owned by isolation and the boiler for any element in the hall. That's right. Uh, so a couple of quick questions. Oh, sorry. Right. A couple of quick questions. So how many property owners uh, are currently participating in Westchester? You said 15? We've closed 15 projects of which uh, two of them were outside of Westchester. So the open day closed? Yes. And so how many applicants have been rejected? We've rejected probably close to 40. And how many applicants have been downgraded from, one, let's say, one value up to a lower threshold? Downgraded? Uh, They're coming to you and they, they, for their, their project, they need $100,000. They don't have any equity in the oh, project. Oh, they're you, you And you said, listen, you're not eligible for 100000 but we can get you fifty. Well, we're capped at 10% of the appraised value of the property, and so we can't finance more than 10% of the value of the property. So we have gone to property owners, and some of them walk away because we can't finance 100% of the project. Um, I would say we probably had about 100 projects walk away because we can't do 100%. And that's particularly upstate. All right, this property value is very low. What was the, the slide? You won't very fast. Uh, the slide that said 80%. 80%, so we, the other criteria we have is that if the mortgage value is 80% or higher, we cannot finance that property. Understood. So the loan value is 8%, but our cap on how much we can finance it. So you're, you're pretty strict. It's, it's definitely a barrier. <laughs> it's not a panacea for people. I mean, how many, let's say the town of Rye entered into this agreement, how many projects would we expect to see? out of the town of Rye, and I assume that Portchester would probably be the largest beneficiary. Say maximum uh, of two years. That's that would qualify and be able to move forward. So it's not, not a, it's, it's not an overburdening uh, burden, I hate to use the word twice. It's not a major burden on the, on the tax receiver to do two projects a year to send out tax bills. And as George said, Gary, I think, um, it, it potentially is a public benefit, you know, for commercial property owners. This is this is something that they people could benefit from if they qualify and if they're eligible. It's a benefit. It's yeah. a benefit for the property owner. Um, it's a benefit and for the, the community because exactly because it, it benefits the environment that they're installing efficient measures, whether it's solar panels or lighting or high efficiency burners beneficial for everybody. Yeah. Um, other comments? Yes. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, just one, one last one. Uh, how many how, how many of these agreements have been have defaulted? None. I mean, we only have had two tax cycles. None of them defaulted. So uh, in Connecticut, they've done over 100 projects, and they've had one. Uh, they had two defaults. One was that the tax receiver didn't run the bill, uh, but the second was a true delinquency of paying taxes. Ultimately, was paid, but it was a delinquent tax bill. But he, me, that taxpayer didn't pay the other taxes as well. It wasn't direct. Well, the Connecticut is actually a little 
less strict here in New York, you have to pay the entire tax bill once. And in Connecticut, you can separate out this tax bill, pace charge, and not pay as okay everything else. No, New York, you can't do that. So in New York, it's exactly right. Yeah, and Mark, I'm sure you, you, you recognize my questions, right, from the last time sure. you were here a couple of years ago. And, and, you know, it's always important, you know, transparency is important as well. And um, to Tom about this and what, what my trepidation was last time um, was that there really wasn't any track record. And I will say that the presentation here today and the information that uh, Mr. Baxter, uh, Councilman Baxter, provided me over the past couple of weeks is very helpful. And this having a track record that we can refer to uh, with solid data uh, helps us make, uh, helps me make a, uh, a better decision. Because I'll be very honest with you, coming into the meeting tonight, um, you know, my, my, I was, I had serious concern. But uh, it seems to be much better, more palatable for me tonight. Thank you. What's your percentage rating to a regular bank? Is your percentage rating low? Because I'm trying to figure out why the business can come to you and not go to their bank that they deal with everything. So if the business has good credit and has access to mortgage and property-based credit, they probably would, but oftentimes that can be cheaper. But a lot of times they don't want to touch that credit or they're maxed out or they, you know, they just don't have that option. Well, if they're maxed out, how are you, how are you going to get them a loan if they're maxed out? Well, typically it's uh, maxed out at 80% or less. So 80% okay. so is at 80%. We can do that. I think, uh, there's, I think you need to work. Wrong term maxed out. Most banks today on a commercial property, they're not going to give more than 70% 70, 70 more to them. So if, um, the, if, the, if, the, if the bank, if the um, property owner is at more than 70%, uh, you're, you're not, you're not going to, they're not going to get an additional loan from the bank, but you're willing to you're saying that they can't be more than 80%. So there's a there's a gap in there between the bank financing and your ability. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's like if you, if you have a credit card, you know, if you have a mortgage on you still use a credit card. This way it's more of a secured loan because their loan is unsecured, but it's, it's secured by the fact that it becomes tax loans, which becomes highest priority, which is even a higher priority than the mortgage. So if they default on the taxes and they have a mortgage, when, when the town forecloses, um, the bank will have the opportunity to pay that off or the bank gets foreclosed out. Right, Jeff? Right. Yeah, but that, if, if, they, if when the town forecloses, that's four years. That's three years of not paying taxes and the fourth year going to court. Well, I, don't think the, I don't think that the issue is, is that. Um, because as we have seen, if the town is forced to foreclose, mm -hmm. even though it's unfortunate for the homeowner, the town ends up making money. Yeah, I know. So I don't think that is a necessary consideration. And you're not talking about a uh, large number here. What is the maximum number? 10% of the rate value. 10% of the And so let's speak to that point, too. Uh, with regards to the reserve that you've built in, which is over a million dollars now, and then you're charging 0.35 uh, fee on every uh, dollar of uh, every dollar um, that are yeah. only you put out. 0.35 percent on every okay. dollar. Okay. And so, just speak to that again. I want, just want to be sure that I know what that represents as far as uh, the support, if there's any kind of default. Well, the uh, so it's called a permanent loss fund. So if we went through the four years of in rem and that property was sold and it was worth less than what you would pay us during that four year period, we would make up the difference. So, you know, again, the worst case scenario is that like the building got blown away, you know, or got washed away, you know, there's no more property there and you have no value. So that's what it's there for. Is that for every project or is that money that's allocated for the whole state? It's for the whole state. It's for the whole state. state. So yep. that money what I'm saying is, is that if you have one property and that million dollars, and then that's, that takes a chunk out of it, is, is it lower coming to another, another project? No, no, I, I think the, so our financial advisors, KFM, which is the largest 
supervisor in the country on um, this type of analysis. And so they've done the analysis on the likelihood of seeing a permanent loss on collection. The fact that we are, again, can't rent or max out of 10% of the grade's value, you'd have to have a disaster scenario okay. for that permanent loss to happen. It just never happens. So okay. that's what we're trying to prevent you from experiencing. Like you may have a, you know, a, some kind of disaster scenario, so that's what the reserves are for. Um, we're not covering, and we're not financing every property either. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so it's, you know, they were doing that. two properties a year, possibly. Maybe tonight. Maybe. Maybe. And the other, the other thing that's different this go around than last time is last time the focus was solar, um, and now you're talking about the opportunity to retro efficiencies. Right, efficiencies yes, yes. to retrofit buildings. Uh, and uh, consult and, and support uh, where you, you know maybe it's maybe the benefit that the, the municipality may provide uh, the homeowner through this agreement is uh, the property owner. Okay. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> the, the property owner uh, is uh, consulting um, and, and giving them that kind of direction as well. So yeah, we try and get the property going. You know, we're not technical consultants, but we do get them on the track for an SRO process or a con ed process so that they get a good quality upgrade and get sent too. I don't, I don't feel, I don't feel is that we're creating two kinds of good. There's the, the goody good of energy conservation, you know, green living, uh, helping the environment, which is one, one good. The other is actually helping the property owner who may be uh, looking for a way to improve his or her bottom line through energy efficiencies and make, uh, make the business in Port Chester or Rybrook or well, not, not too many businesses in Ryan now. A few. Yes. But, um, you know, make those businesses more successful, which is a success for our community as well. I have a quick question about sort of the model that you use, because what you're doing is you're creating the payoff through taxes. So wouldn't, if the current owner were to go through your program, and then sell the property, the property would be valued at a higher rate because of the efficiencies, and then they'd be charged the tax, they'd be double sort of charged, and yeah. the original owner would kind of. It's a great question, and uh, it really depends on the type of upgrade, too. If you're doing work like insulation or putting lights, I'm not sure the valuation would go up, although your assessor could probably answer that. Better. Solar could do that, but there actually is an exemption in New York State for a certain amount of solar that would not raise your property taxes. But that is that always comes up. You know, how does this affect the assessed value of the property? Commercial buildings, the way you assess those properties are based on income in the respects. Does that income translate into a higher valuation? It's a yeah. I mean, complicated if you question. Looking at replacing the boiler and putting it in a heat system, that would. Right, Denise, that would increase. That, it doesn't necessarily, if it's general upkeep, mm -hmm. it, would, it wouldn't necessarily increase your assessment. So, um, I, I think that's, I'm sorry. But it would increase the value of the property. Yeah, of course, you know, when you sell it. Obviously. Yeah, so when you go to sell it, you would, you know, charge extra because you have the yes. upgraded heating system, and then, you know, if you are the new purchaser, you would. Well, that, that's a determination. What, what you're getting at is a determination that the owner would have to make. If, if he's not going to make a decision to, to his um, business detriment, so he would be weighing any possible increase in assessed value and for taxes against the cost savings that he would get um, well, I think you know, as a result of the, uh, of the energy efficiency. I think I'm kind of confusing assessment and appraisal. I guess the appraised value, and I, I'm sorry for speaking, the appraised value will go up, obviously. So the and the lower energy costs. You know, again, that's something that's more and more being flagged in the real estate marketplace. The energy costs are lower than the average. You can market that now. So that building will be more valuable because it's just lower to operate. So. And then I guess the other question I had, and 
may not have anything to do with us, but I saw it and it caught my eye. The, you have religious institutions that are participating as well. And they are tax exempt from certain taxes, but you still would provide them with a tax bill. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Well, but don't forget, they're also, they're, they're exempt from real estate taxes, but they still pay other charges, such as sewer charges. No, those charges are, are, are on there, and this would be an added charge. I've got another question. Um, say a commercial building, and they sell they sell the property in the building. Why couldn't they pay off their uh, their their loan to you at once when they sell the building, pay off the debt? Why has it got to be transferred to the new owner? So we designed the program years ago and tried to be as consistent with how taxes are levied and paid. And so we looked at how water and sewer and sidewalks are you know, afraid and assessed and charged and how they are never going to be paid off. So we modeled it that way, and that's kind of how we did it for now. But we have figured out a way for the property to be paid. Our current capital structure, though, does not allow it, but we are going to revise that in the road so that it could be paid. There's a, there's a bit of a debate on around that because if you allow the repayment, then the property owner is going to think that they will have to repay it and thus they won't do the deeper improvements. So there's a psychology component there too that we're a little hesitant on, but I think ultimately we're going to head to having that option. Now if you do that option, are you going to let people that previously got the loans be able to do the same option? Probably. We have to figure that out. I mean, we we uh, originally designed it with again, our current property buyer saying that we know we can, but I think we're all on board with the idea, so now it's just a matter of, okay, it's right, and that costs money, and we do that on legal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You know, complex, but we're working on that. And okay. When new capital comes in, it'll be picked up. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Are we ready to close the public hearing? So moved. Second.
Um, and that's basically why I'm here, and it's more of an informative. Um, so um, just to give you kind of an idea of the bond itself in general, we um, examined and developed recommendations uh, from the board. Uh, they gave us all the recommendations that they thought uh, what would be needed. Um, we're trying to address the overcrowding in the schools right now. I'm going to have George talk a little bit about some of the overcrowding issues we do have in the school. Uh, currently, the bond um, is going to uh, increase the uh, number of classrooms in the high school um, and uh, increase and change the gym size and actually add a uh, turf field. Uh, the elementary school is going to be affected too, is King Street and uh, JFK. It's going to add an additional 15 classrooms at elementary size school. Um, again, and um, the bond, um, again, is going to be March 28th, um, and I'll have George come up and talk a little bit about some of the uh, specifics on the enrollment comparisons and the cost and some of the uh, financials behind it. Good evening again, George Ford, uh, Worcester. Um, Keith, thank you. I think, you know, we wanted to come tonight just to make sure that the residents of Rybrook who are uh, taxpayers in the Port Chester School District are aware of what's going on. Unfortunately, we aren't able to go to the Rybrook uh, Village meeting because that meeting is being held the same day as the vote next Tuesday, so we will miss those residents uh, the day of the vote. Um, I think, uh, as Keith alluded to, uh, the Port Chester School District has the taxpayers have had voter, the voter apathy over the years. We've seen many of the bonds that have been put up for passage have failed. They've been defeated, defeated all different numbers, 8 million, 20 million, all different sizes. And unfortunately, the school district is at a point right now where there is significant overcrowding in this district. And uh, without the investment, um, I'm sure we all realize the cost of doing nothing could be detrimental uh, to our school district and our community. Just as this potential uh, case program, you're helping businesses find other ways to finance projects and do good things for the community. Investing in kids and our school district is always a good thing to contribute to. And I know we're asking the taxpayers, and again, Keith and I are not part of the Board of Education. We're part of a, a resident uh, committee that was put together to advise the board event of what to do and you know I'm thankful that in meeting the people that were on this committee, the residents that formed uh, this committee and were accepted, um, I get that I'm very happy to have been spending the time with them over the last six to seven Sorry. months. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we've, as a collective group, we realized, wow, you know, we really, really are doing the right thing here. Um, the bond failing last year was for many different reasons. It just wasn't money. Um, you know, the, the real reason last year for the bond failing was the fact that we were touching that majestic high school here in the village of Rock. And um, here we are today. We've redesigned that plan with the architects. Uh, we're not touching the beauty of that view from Park Avenue. Uh, we're still able to uh, the goals of, of the uh, Board of Education and the requirements of space that's needed today uh, by adding 11 classrooms, three room science suite, a regulation sized gym. There's been a lot of things out in, in the community the last few months that uh, our proposal, which again, 20 people voted yes for, two people voted no, and one of, one of them abstained, which was Mr. Hyman, and he has publicly come out and said, although his plan was picked he's going to support the bond anyway, even though we abstained in the final vote. But there has been many inaccuracies about this bond uh, that we've tried to discuss so that people get the real facts, not the alternative facts uh, that want to be discussed out in the public. Um, so the cost here is $75 for every $100,000 of value for a, a resident that has a, a, a homestead property in the village of Porchester. So on a $400,000 assessment, somebody's going to skip $300 increase on their tax bill. And again, home values are tied to school districts. They're tied to our kids' education and 
how we invest in our kids and how they're going to pay us back in the future. Um, you know, one of the things I was disappointed a little bit is some of the people that have been outspoken against the bond, they've continued to come up with reasons as to why people should vote no for this. And they always have a reason that another week they're finding something. And it's unfortunate. Um, I get it. Nobody wants to raise their hand for a tax increase, right? I get it. But this is necessary. And um, the contribution to our kids and what we'll get back from that, it will benefit everybody in teaching our kids, educating our kids, getting them out to the community, getting them better jobs as they grow up, better sports programs in our school. All of these things are tied to better citizens. And of course, the whole value aspect, which we all know when we look at some of our surrounding communities, um, districts that invest in their schools, their property value is lost. That doesn't necessarily mean that your tax bill is going to go up because your land value will go up. It's a blanket assessment of all properties moving up in that community. So from that perspective, uh, there's been some things out there that people have said, oh, you're one, well, your value goes up, your, your top property tax is going to go up. Well, it's not just one person. The value of the community rises. So we wanted to come tonight to try to reach out. Um, it, it, it's funny, we uh, did a presentation this week, and one of our members talked about when the high school was built in 1932. Uh, that plan, believe it or not, the taxpayers voted for a more expensive plan back in 1930 because they saw the vision of that high school. Instead of having a flat roof on that building, they voted for that majestic, beautiful pitched roof. And here we are today. We're going through the motions that they went through, fighting for uh, a school to make improvements, um, going to civic engagements, going out to meet with different uh, groups within the community, being in these meetings to talk to people to inform them of the facts. Um, the high school was only uh, built to hold 1,000 kids. There's 1,500 kids in that high school today. We have four elementary schools, and the numbers today compared to what they were in 1970-71 for our elementary schools, there were about 360 uh, child difference. There were uh, 2,399 kids in our district in the elementary school in 1970-71, today there's about 2,033, but we have three less elementary schools. Because the school district over the years, the Board of Education sold all schools throughout the village. That's why we're faced with these uh, space constraints. So here we are today, again, as a, uh, a resident civic group that came together. We're asking for the public to come out on Tuesday and to support our community. This is a bond that will dramatically change Port Chester. Not only the downtown, the investment that's going on there, the, all the investments happening in real estate in Port Chester are thriving capital theater and restaurants. It's time we invest in our kids as well. We cannot leave that behind. So we ask you to come out and support it on March 28th. Porchester Middle School, the polls open from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Jones, and thank you, Mr. Molina. You have any questions? Sure. Yeah, I do. Sure. The combined. Now, <clears throat> a couple things. One, this is over a few period of years. It's not something the $8 million is not going to be everything done at one time. Correct. That's a very good point. Thank you, Mr. So the, the way the bond's going to happen, yes, of course, in a month from now, we're not going to all wake up and these schools are all going to be built and your tax bill goes up in one year. The school is going to proportionally pull $80 million in a bond as they need it. They'll do small bonds. Maybe this year they'll pull $5 million to start the actual construction and engineering drawings. Uh, once they get all the bids back and all that's taken care of, that's probably going to be a nine-month nine month process. Then next year they'll pull another sum of money to start the actual construction at the high school and then maybe some of the elementary school and then a third year of pulling. So the, the project, yes, you're correct. Over the first three years, you're going to get small increases each year on your tax bill until all the money has been bonded for and then finalized under one like, big bond where then it will carry forward. Also, people don't understand the overcrowding issue. Correct. You know, people say overcrowding, but I know for a fact the classrooms are some of them are standing room only. They're putting kids in the basement. They're using the lunchroom. And, they, and the elementary school, I know one of the elementary schools, they're putting them in the hallways to give class. So it, it's, and I know.
know people aren't gonna like me saying this, you gotta vote for the bond. Yeah, and I don't care. It's yeah. it's gotta be done. It's for the kids. I appreciate that. And you're you are hitting points that I with my short time I'm trying to condense my uh, my uh, five minutes, but yes, there are speech, occupational therapy, physical therapy. Uh, uh, sessions that are happening in hallways at the school because they don't have the space to do that. They're 27 to 28 kids in a classroom. Um, the other thing is the high school, for example, most schools, these school, schools were all built a long time ago. You know, when you think about when you buy a piece of furniture today, then you know, your grandmother's furniture 50 years ago, it's much bigger today. Cars are bigger. Everything's bigger today, right? Kids are bigger. Um, you know, the classrooms then were built about 550 square feet. A, State regulated classroom today, depending on what type of classroom it is, minimum 770 square feet, up to 960 square feet. And our gym at the high school, we were there tonight for a rally, there was probably 250 people there. You can't have a basketball game there. We're renting space at purchase to have our wrestling and basketball teams go over to purchase. We're paying for buses to take the kids there. Same thing with the, the football field. Uh, people think that that's a thrill getting a turf field, but it really isn't because we're gonna have cost savings with seed replacement, downtime on the field, taking the kids to purchase, renting other space, busing. And then again, the gyms at the high school, at the elementary schools, the two elementary school uh, gyms that we're at, because we have cafferneesiums. They're dual-use uh, cafeterias, at the gym and the cafeteria, which number one is in sanitary, and number two, when it's inclement weather outside, kids are stuck in a classroom, six, seven, eight-year-olds. They need to get out and release energy, and they can't do that in those elementary schools. So. Thank you for your points and your support. I just want to make one uh, clarification point. Uh, George, you mentioned, um, and this is one of the fallacies that uh, we're trying to discuss too. Even though it is an $80 million bond, 39% of it is being funded by the city of New York. So in actuality, what's going to be responsibility for the uh, residents or the school district is going to be $49 million. So it's not even a $80 million bond, it's going to be $49 million who's going to be responsible for it. And that's where we get the $360, we looked it out about $360 annually per resident, you know, or per residential home. That's how it worked out to be. So to George's point, like he says, uh, like George had mentioned, uh, in conclusion, uh, the importance of this bond is, is obvious. Uh, you knew very well and uh, of the overcrowding situation. People don't know that. They hear overcrowding, they have no clue. You know, you, you, you really hit a, 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 an important point about this too, because I didn't, halfway going through this bond, I, I, I wanted to get involved with this because my taxes are going to go up. I know this. And if my taxes are going to go up, I don't really know why my taxes are going to go up. So when you talk this, and what George is saying, talking about this overcrowding, you mentioned it, I didn't get appreciation of it until I actually toured the school with the kids there. And that's when it, it struck me. It really hit me. Um, and uh, because of that, um, I've been more passionate, and George's been more passionate, and the third people in this group that's went on, been extraordinarily passionate about this. Um, to your point, they were. I saw these kids sitting in the auditorium in the, in the, in the back. They were lecturing there, and um, kids in the boiler uh, studying. And when I saw these OT in the hallways of the elementary school, that's when I realized it needed to be done. So um, thank you, uh, and really, I hope, uh, if you have any other questions, please let us know. We're going to be here for a little bit, too. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Um, any other comments from the public? We're on uh, resolutions. The first is uh, Sturgis uh, Government Resolutions. Maybe um, I think. The next uh, reader is kind of yours.
is a web developer. Um, it, it is the exclusive partner of PayPal um, for government services, government services space. They do a wide range of um, web-based services to communities. We are um, the first community in the state of New York that Sturgis will be doing business with. We have started with a very small arrangement. Um, witness it's uh, for $1,850. They are developing for us a system whereby our community members will be able to go pull up a web page from our website, see when the pavilion, when the mansions, when the ball fields are available to be rented. They will be able to um, complete that rental application online. They'll be able to pay for it online if they so choose. They can also still come into the office or pick up the phone and call Brenda and do it the old-fashioned way. Um, it will also enable us to, for the first time, um, take payments through the supervisor's office uh, by credit card, which we don't currently do. Um, so that's the agreement. If this is a relationship that works and develops, there are many other web-based services and um, um, that, that we might explore with them that will make the lives of our community members easier. They take tax payments for them. Oh, they take tax payments. Mr. Mm -hmm. Tax Receiver. Mm -hmm. Might make your life easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this is a one time thing. Yeah, yeah, make you upset. You may say, you got to see that, right? <laughs> Is there an ongoing fee going forward? There's not a one. There's not an ongoing fee. There, this is a one-time fee. But there's a fee for transaction. Uh, the yes, credit card charges, right. uh, which they are. Um, uh, PayPal has agreed to match or better the uh, credit card charges that uh, T Bank charges. Um, we currently take credit card payments at the other side of the office, and uh, no match those. So, for the transaction, the town of Ryan pays that uh, that transaction fee. At the moment, yeah. unless unless we want to alter our, uh, we might want to change our fees if people uh, pay online. Consider that. Yeah. So if, a, if someone oh, pays, can't. A three, yeah, we can't. Excuse me. Apparently we can't. If someone pays, a, uh, let's just say, a, a $300 park pass, and they pay a transaction fee of, you know, 2.5%, as opposed to a $10,000 tax payment to uh, Mr. Mecca's office, you know, that is 2.5%. You know, what I don't, what was it, plus 30 cents? Uh, plus 30 cents per transaction. What I don't want to do is to create an avenue uh, where we're, yes, making it more comfortable for uh, the community to pay, but uh, we're also looking at uh, increasing our expenses. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not here today to talk about accepting tax payments. So I think that's, that's a uh, financial structure that will have to be thoroughly explored to have that conversation. Right now, this is, um, this is
have paid many government obligations through the internet, and there almost always is a charge for using the credit card as opposed to sending sending them a check. A lot of people use debit cards that have the credit card logo on. So there's an issue there. But we really, before we do this, uh, in terms of tax payments, like that, you know, we're getting to that area. We need to. Um, I can't answer at this moment, but I do know that there's an issue and a difference between paying for debit cards. Is it possible that we can we can take credit cards and not debit cards? I don't know. I think we can explore the future contract and look into it. It's not it's not very expensive in this contract. And we can we can try it for a period of time and see what happens. Yeah. And if necessary, if it is costing us money, if we, if we raise the rate by five dollars or whatever, and so it's going to cover the cost. I don't know what the number is, but it's not, it's not a large number. If you're renting, if you're renting something for what is a normal rental of the property? Seven hundred fifty dollars. Okay. Big party. All right. So if you raise it to seven sixty, probably cover the cost. That there are uh, there are issues that arise between let's, let's categorize ourselves as a merchant. So if a merchant has a relationship with a credit card processing company, you know, whatever, whether it's PayPal or whatever, we need to take a look at that before we do search our control search our to move into the 21st century. Right. We can no longer, whatever the, the bottom line is on uh, uh, what the charge will be, we, we cannot, in the 21st century, offer our facilities for having somebody spend time on the phone and pulling out a piece of paper and bringing it in and bringing a check. I mean, it's causing us more money that way in staff time than any credit card charge. Nothing about science should prohibit you from voting. That's right. Okay. But, but your, uh, Mr. Attorney, your, your concerns are noted by this council and by the uh, Secretary Chief of Staff, and we we'll look at it. Okay? And this is strictly for reserving the mansion? Yes. And anything else? Proper part. So, Proper part. whatever. So, yeah, the field, that's it. The field's the mansion. Okay. All right. May I have a motion and a second? So, second. Ms. Caldwell? Councilperson Jackson? Yes. Councilperson Martin? Yes. Councilperson Baxter? Yes. Councilperson Villanova? Yes. And Supervisor? Yes. Uh, next item is the renewal of the Sullivan data contract. There's uh, uh, <coughs> not anything to do with Nancy about this resolution. Uh, as you know, Sullivan Data has been our IT service provider for, I think, six years, um, as I understand it. Yep. Um, they uh, contract is up for renewal. Um, it's a one-year renewal um, for the exact same price that they've been paying. There's no change. Um, they have told us that there may be an upcharge next year, um, but not now. That's a separate issue. This is ongoing support. The, the server, the server issue that we discussed before is in our budget, and um, I thought that was being installed. It's in process. Yes, we got a. Uh, I, I can misspoke earlier. We did our. One of the pieces of our server system, I mean, we're just going to you right now, um, failed. And they raced down from Northern Westchester and gave us a loaner. That's been replaced. And we are now in the process of um, getting uh, KVS scheduled so that they can affect the changeover within the next week or so. Okay. Thank you. Motion and a second, please. So moved. Second. 
Councilperson Jackson. Councilperson. Yes. Councilperson Martin. Yes. Councilperson Baxter. Yes. Councilperson Villanova. Yes. And supervisors are to Yes. Uh, next item is a contract with iCompass Technology. And this one is also interesting. iCompass is an online agenda management software. Um, it came to us with glowing recommendations from the village of Rybrook. Um, we've explored it. I've also spent time exploring a couple of other um, packages as well. Um, and this is um, both a, uh, a step toward technology with an eye towards um, staff efficiency, but also greater transparency for the community. Um, this will enable us to um, make it easier to publish our agendas online, um, to, uh, to enable people to sign up automatically through a portal for any news about the town, um, and that information will go straight out. Um, this will be a sufficient uh, time uh, and a, um, a time savings for the staff, which currently make up our agendas in a very manual way. Um, with Word documents and uh, Excel documents and transferring to PDFs, and um, it's, uh, it's, it's highly time consuming as well. So this will um, promises to be a significant savings of time and uh, enable us to um, make fewer errors. I have a quick question about this. Will this program also be used to track the Rye Town Park Commission as well? Yes. And they really okay, because I know that on our website we handle that. We do. And yes, this will be updated accordingly. And this also uh, has a component for a foil tracker. Yes. Currently, uh, we handle foils also uh, in a very manual way. Um, with, uh, and this is, will enable us to, for, uh, enable members of the community when they wish to enter a foil, they can enter it through a portal on our computer, on our, on our webpage. Um, it will go into a system. It will um, send out an acknowledgement um, on our letterhead. I think for the, um, for the benefit of the residents watching at home, they don't understand, they may not know what a foil is. Uh, the Freedom of Information <laughs> Law. I think most of the residents actually do. <laughs> and, and the press certainly does. Right. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm just a country lawyer. So, so cur currently, the only mechanism for sending a um, Freedom of Information Law request to the government of Rye is to walk in on a piece of paper or to email it. Um, this will give residents a way to formally um, enter their Freedom of Information Law request through a web page, with a form, it will come in, it will be recorded, um, it will be acknowledged, and um, it will start a clock because responses um, must be timely and will enable the staff to handle those things um, in a much more met met methodical way. Way. Now, will the acknowledgement be sent immediately? No, through the system because there's the five day and then the twenty day from the five day. Correct. How many foils do we receive annually? Or I guess <laughs> not annually. That, but that's a question for the clerk. <laughs> do we receive a large volume of them? I know the bill well, from the gets it. So on this issue, I actually consulted with my um, very knowledgeable predecessor who informed me that in his uh, somewhat eight, nine years, he had maybe he could count them on one hand. However, in the last... That, um, by the way, that's just for the commission. Just for the commission. Yeah, Hope handles the uh, foils for the... Right, so for the commission. For the commission. And that's better than a lot of... Okay, so for the commission, in the last, call it six months, uh, at least seven. Oh, lucky you. So that means Lindsay just asked, asked Lindsay asked about the, the sharing of the of the the, the the park commission will use this as well. Forty nine hundred dollars is that the town is that the total fee to be split between the two entities or yes. is that our share? Nope. So the commission will be paying a portion of that. Yes. Do we know what that is? 
We haven't just we haven't uh, determined an allocation yet. Okay. Um, we did discuss that with the controller. Okay. And the and the accounts. And and of course the accounts. Um, I have one other question. I guess um, it's kind of the past three resolutions because we are talking about technology and technical updates. We also, during the budget season, talked about updating our computers. The um, the workstations, you mean? Yes. The yes, that's a no. Oh, wow. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure we had the capabilities. Oh, we're moving. We're moving. Yeah, that we're was moving. That was all done in 2016. Okay. The server upgrade, that's for 2017. So that process started as soon as we changed over to the new year. And then this um, ICOPIS says a lot more to it. it um, I don't think you mentioned, mentioned something about the agenda, but it, it puts all the agenda packet together, correct? Yes, it, it, it does. It does. It, it's it's a all the packet, and it, it, and it publishes it. It together, it publishes it. Um, if the uh, council members would like to, this, uh, this is a system that was designed for a non paper based agenda for the, count, for the council. So you could um, easily um, see your agenda on a tablet, on a laptop, computer, annotate it, make notes on it um, on the laptop as well. So you don't have to have paper if you don't want it, you want it, you got it. Um, it also automatically transitions from the agenda into a draft of minutes, which will enable us to produce the minutes much faster than is currently possible. Uh, and circulate those very quickly as well. Uh, and keeping well, obviously, this is uh, the budget impact is uh, is, is limited uh, annually, and, and even you know we're going further. That's going to be split uh, with the you know, Right Town Park Commission. I think that's great. Um, I would also then suggest that uh, we look into uh, getting tablets for all council members and the uh, and the uh, department heads. Uh, one thing that I use in all is board effects, and so all the boards and commissions, I can even show it to you, uh, all the boards and commissions that I'm on, but I got the board effects, I get a tablet, and I can pull up the agendas, everything historical, and do the same thing, mm -hmm. work it up. So I think it's a great idea, I think that's, uh, if we're going to go that way, um, then let's, let's dump the three binders and let's go to the tablets right away. Let's just start with Okay.
but I will say this, that you, you can't have electric vehicles when you don't have charging stations. Then you would have like statues, right? They need to be able to charge along the way. Rye has two charging stations. Um, both are privately owned, one by Nissan to charge their own leaf, their leaf vehicles, and one um, at where I work, Serendipity Labs, which Tesla put in to charge Tesla vehicles. But there are no public charging stations. Um, the nearest public charging station is to us would be one of Ameriac, two New Rochelle, ten White Plains. So we have an opportunity to um, ask the state for a rebate. They will give us 16,000 or 80 percent of the potential cost of installing. Um, and they will also um, provide, um, um, they'll pay for the electricity for two years to promote the use of this. So the, the basic outcome, we're, at, we're only asking for um, a rebate on a charging station, which would allow us to get this operating and get this installed within like six months. But let me bring up Ron. Ron's with Sustainable Westchester to talk a little bit about what the demand has been and why this would be a beneficial thing. Thanks, folks. Um, Rod Cameron, um, actually with Earth Kind Energy, we're uh, a contractor, a, a consultant to Sustainable Westchester. Our mission is actually to help municipalities look at transportation. I'm running a clean transportation project, looking to figure out how to bring technology to reduce costs, as well as have a positive impact on uh, pollution, reducing pollution and affecting the environment. So um, you guys are all familiar with Sustainable Westchester, right? So I don't need to go into that. Great. Um, you know, you think a look at transportation in the states, 40% of the greenhouse gases or 40% of the emissions. Uh, it's by far the majority. Um, the technology now is evolving really rapidly. And uh, right now, of course, the world is 2 million electric vehicles, um, over almost 600,000 in the United States alone. It's growing 40% a year in the U.S. It's growing 7% across the world. The Department of Energy has found that the majority of our trips, as individual and collectively, are less than six miles, 57% are less than six miles, 90% are less than 30 miles. So for the vast majority of all the trips that we've taken, electric vehicle technology currently, we're the most rudimentary, could handle all our, all our activities. Um, what we're seeing is an 18% per year cost reduction. So just like you know, this was a supercomputer uh, 10 years ago, multi-million dollars, we're seeing the same sort of trends happening with technology and cost reduction. Um, part of the nice thing about it is that these vehicles are 90% efficient when they transfer energy into transportation. So compared to gas vehicles, which are about 20% efficient in terms of how they, they turn uh, fuel into, into transportation and waste 80% of the energy and heat, these are 90% efficient. Um, on maintenance, where a gas engine has about 2,000 moving parts, a electric vehicle has about 20. So the maintenance costs are dramatically. We're also seeing cost reductions on fuel. So when you take a look at the price per gallon comparison, you're looking at a savings of over 50 to 75, 70% in transportation costs, where basically what you do with electric vehicles is getting gas at the equivalent of a dollar a gallon or less, and locking that in for pretty much your lifetime. People are familiar with the Teslas, right? And I think, uh, I don't say Someone. somebody has one, right? So zero to 60 in uh, less than three seconds, right? Pretty amazing vehicle, right? A um, little costly on the first ones, right? But the reality is now Tesla came out with a new vehicle that's going to be released later this year, the Model 3, $35,000. So you're getting the performance now of a Porsche for the price of a Buick. And that's what's happening across the board. They have every manufacturer in the world looking and producing and moving out these electric vehicles. Um, Tesla, by the way, uh, announced the Model 3. Um, the people here, how many deposits they got? $1,000 each. No vehicle, nothing to be seen, can't take a ride in it. Maybe it'll happen, hopefully it'll happen, right? 400,000 people put down $1,000 sight unseen 400 million dollars of prepayments on a vehicle that's not even around here. 
So the demand is here. People want these things. They're coming. The technology is improving constantly. We're getting more and more places to go. Um, but part of it is the leadership that's happening. And, you know, across the, across the auto manufacturing, and just to give you a sense, I mean, you got GM with the Chevy Bulge, you got Audi's, BMW, Nissan, Tesla, and Ford is investing $4.5 billion in electric technology now to come out with not just the sedans that we all drive, but also starting to move into the heavier vehicles. So you're going to see a Ford F-150 truck coming out. You're going to see garbage trucks. You're going to see all sorts of heavier equipment, all sorts of transport equipment, etc. cetera, that's going to be coming soon. Um, the demand, well, was driven partially by federal fuel efficiency standards. The reality is that it's really leadership on the local level that's now starting to drive this. And I don't know if you saw last month in February, there were uh, cities on the West Coast that came together, that put together a, 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 an aggregate purchase that they're talking about of 24,000 vehicles, which seemed like a pretty incredible amount. Until this month, 30 cities now have come together, and collectively they're putting forth a purchase of over 114,000 vehicles for a $30 billion purchase that, again, every major manufacturer is taking a look at and starting to step into. Um, the opportunity is, as Drew said, and by the way, Drew, you've got incredible, so you guys are very uh, Tremendous staff here and tremendous, uh, tremendous support. Um, it is a $3 million fund specifically to municipalities to help municipalities both develop fleets and charging infrastructure to get this out to the public. Um, the first, this is the kind of the first phase of what's going to be a sustainable Westchester longer project. Ultimately, what we want to do is what Colorado and other communities have done, which is aggregate community purchases and drive down the cost of vehicles overall for residents, businesses, nonprofits, everybody else. Um, Colorado, they ran a campaign to reduce the cost of the Nissan Leaf from over $30,000. The event effect to people were under 13. New York State is doing something similar now with municipal fleets. We're seeing Nissan Leafs and other vehicles that normally go for $30,000 netting out at about $20,000. And actually, New York State providing additional rebates to bring it down to like 17. So the demand is coming. Um, one of the things he also does. One thing you didn't mention. Oh, please. I believe that in the governor's budget, he's proposing. Uh, rebates for electric vehicles on the Correct. same project. Exactly. Two thousand dollars per vehicle starting with us. That is absolutely right. And actually this week what the announcement was was that dealers who are selling these vehicles will get seventeen hundred dollars uh, back to the dealers, which helps them to reduce the price as well. So the incentives are starting to happen, the, all these different pieces are happening, but really it's a question of which communities are going to lead and who's going to help start the way. This opportunity in front of you guys is to put a two port electric vehicle charging station um, here on your grounds. It would be a total cost of about $30,000. New York State will give you $16,000. I think that's what you're voting on today. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, it's a tremendous opportunity. Um, what that gets you, by the way, is pretty much a free charging station. Five years of monitoring, so it's all software. Um, all the apps that go with that, so you can charge different people, different rates at different times. You can not have to charge your vehicles if you have uh, town vehicles that you want to um, have charged there eventually. You can do all rate structures in different ways. You can do the reporting things that you need. Um, and then 95, 98%, excuse me, uptime. So it's five years of warranty, five years of monitoring, the free equipment, and then basically it also helps you pay for some of the labor. The labor here is a little expensive because the way you have to run the electric. Um, but ultimately, this technology is coming, and it'd be your first full rate to step it out. So. Right. Questions? Okay. Um, well, it? Yeah. I guess um, the first question is: You, or Judy, had mentioned that the electricity for the first two years is covered entirely by the state. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I believe, but. After that, you would be charging the consumer or the driver? You can do it however you want to do it at whatever point in time you want. So the app lets you start to charge immediately, you start to charge later, but the other state's going to reimburse you if you decide to, uh, to give it for free. Okay. So we can set a precedent where we charge per... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can do it up front. Just I don't think the state will reimburse you if you charge it. You know, the side, so. And I know you had mentioned that it was a five-year warranty. Mm -hmm. Buffer to buffer, 98% guaranteed on time. Yep, so pretty and, much anything that happens to it. And monitoring. And monitoring, yep. But what's the normal lifespan? Um, so the normal lifespan would say would be about 10 years on the equipment. Um, there's some parts of that that get covered in the warranty to extend the warranty. So in particular, the wires, you know, as you pull the wires and plug them in and such, so those kind of goes. But if you keep the warranty up, that covers that as well. 
Um, and it can last forever. But basically, when you're in the monitoring and warranty piece, the software is the real thing that goes. Um, and otherwise, you're covered under the warranty. So my recommendation would be try it for five years, see how you like it. If you like it, continue to go forward. Keep the warranty and the monitoring effect, and just you know, don't have to worry about it. And the maintenance, I guess, would be entirely covered under the warranty. Exactly. Oh, okay. And then, how much space is it going to take up? Because especially when we're talking about doing here, you know, the more parking, the better. Yeah, I mean, this is two two port charges, so it's two parking spaces, and there's in the middle of them. It's a pole and smaller than this, so you know, half the size. Because I'm just thinking of a beautiful Sunday. <laughs> You know, when you have the fields being occupied, the playground being occupied. I, you know, the, the real thing is that, um, one, demonstrating the technology and helping people adopt it and adopt it and seeing it out there. I mean, we're going to see more and more of this. We're going to start to see it. Westchester has over 2,000 vehicles. The North Metropolitan uh, area has over 3,000 vehicles. Um, so it's just going to keep going. It's growing exponentially. So the question is, are you going to be at the forefront of it? An opportunity. It's a great opportunity, I think, to get some free state money to make it happen. Joe Paul. So now the equipment is $30,000. All together, all in With the installation, and you, as you mentioned, you said the labor yeah. would cost the pain. We have to go out to bid probably for the electrical work. Um, you know, we, we got an estimate, that's where we got the number from. But Judy, we're getting 16 back from the state. We're, we're committing to, not, to, to a number not to exceed 14. 14. Yeah. Right, so it can come, it can come in under. Correct. Yeah, correct. Yeah, correct. correct. yeah, that's the way we set Which up the project correct. so that would save the unit and then we would put out to the installation. I just woke up again, so I forgot to tell you one thing. This comes with something. Hi, Julie. So we don't even have a need for having that conversation today. So as a town, it would give us tools that we don't have to talk about carbon footprints and, and greenhouse gas emissions um, and to get people um, more engaged in other sustainable efforts. Do we have an idea, I guess, maybe sustainable Westchester or an estimate of how many um, Rye Town residents or area residents drive electrical vehicles? I know there's 2,000 in New York State. I can look it up if I need it. Is it nice that has those registration department of, uh, of uh, motor vehicles has some of them? So yeah, we can get that number. It's a relatively small number now. Yeah. But yeah it's wrong. So it's like with two Nissan's in Porchester. They say they sell three or four a year, but the, the rebate is coming in, the consumer rebate. And the rebate is going to drive behaviors. And the same thing is there's only two charging stations. And there's hardly any on the sound shore at all. So it's a genetic thing. Once you start having what well, we hope to put one here and make it visible to encourage conversation about sustainable methods. I don't, I, go ahead, Tom. I was just going to ask oh, uh, first of all, I know Merrick Parkway, there's all the way up the parkway, they have charging stations. Mm -hmm. uh, but what would the, after the two years, what would the state be charging us for the electricity? Um, well, whatever your rate is, so it's okay. not a matter of what the state is paying. Okay, so what you're call. paying, but don't forget, we're going to be charging. charging. We can charge on the charging stations, right. so we're going to we may actually make money on the charging stations. And, okay. and um, at Serendipity, the, the Tesla station um, averages at about four dollars a kilowatt. Okay, we we can charge. We also have the opportunity, depending on where it is, although a Solar option may not be the best way to offset the uh, electric use for the entire town. There could be a solar option that could be a component to this where the solar option covers the electric use. Yeah. So you, you know, you're really hitting it hard there and charging the consumer uh, for the charge station as well. So I want to say. I, I enjoy, I've never met you before, Mr. Kim, but I, I love listening to people that know their topic. And uh, I'm going to do chase, and uh, you're spot on. Thank you. Uh, just I do. Oh, I'm sorry. I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just 
to follow up on what he said. So, uh, Sustainable Westchester you know, has this municipal solar buyers group that you may or may not opt into, but as part of that pricing, it winds up that if you put it in a carport and look yeah. at that equivalent, it's a dollar a gallon. I mean, you know, uh, give me a 20 year contract for a dollar a gallon, yes. I mean, would you take it? Uh, I would think that's a pretty good bet. This <laughs> meeting, right? So, we have another consideration. This is a part. So, if we're going to put on a solar carport, we have to discuss that with the, the community, oh, to the friends. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just to because it's a great opportunity. Yeah. And, because, and because, because Judy is here, I want to thank Judy and, uh, and um, Laura, um, also met with uh, Rob Sachs from last month's meeting. I want to thank you again for meeting with Rob, and, and we'll look to continue to go forward with some grant options there. So. Uh, I appreciate it, I really do. Absolutely. I like to have fun, but I also want to let you know that uh, I appreciate everything you do. Okay, that's, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now, yeah. it's there also to sort of get the word out about great. the carpool? Yeah, um, so a couple things. So um, one of the things is to have the spots themselves mm -hmm. be sort of painted white and green or some other thing and label. Um, we want some signage both here and around the community, electric vehicle charging stations and direct there. Kind of like the hospital signs. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. exactly. Online, um, both you want it on your website, plus there's a state website, plus the uh, charging station has a website, plus right now there's the Department of Energy website. Um, we'll see what happens with that piece. I mean, it's necessarily a threat from that piece. to see what's happening. But, um, but um, right now there's a lot of things we're getting it out, and mostly it's local, right? So, but on everybody's app, basically, when they pull up their app, they'll see a charging station here, so that's a nice piece of publicity. Because I remember um, even, you know, years.
is on the verge of needing replacement debt. And one of the things that they looked into was the possibility of getting a grant yep. to, to, to the the grant grant to like, Unfortunately, um, we were this close to looking at a vehicle. GM had uh, one of their VPs who had left and started the company. Look great, see great, technology was great, it was built great, but they basically ran out of money and just couldn't make the recommendation. And once we did the due diligence on that vehicle, it was like California, Verizon had gotten sets of them, and unfortunately they were just, they worked great when they were worked great, but they didn't have the support in the back of them. So that's the only concern, is that my job is to make sure that you guys are well protected. The sedans, absolutely. Charging stations, fantastic. Heavy vehicles, let's wait another year and a half or two, but it's definitely down the line coming, no doubt about it. Okay, now I can, I, I can anticipate. Let me 
remind the council, we have several items left to go. We have our receiver waiting, we have our assessor waiting, we have our controller waiting, and um, so let's, let us let us move this along. Okay. The brands uh -huh. of cars, yeah. the outlet is universal. Yes, that's right. Level two is so you need this to apply for a rebate through New York State, and if we're awarded a rebate, the town is committing to an amount no less, no more than fourteen thousand dollars. That is correct. So moved. Lindsay, <laughs> second. I will second it. Well, we have the first. Councilperson Jackson. Yes. Yes. Do you have any more questions? I thought I asked that for this commission meeting. All right. Your next resolution. Thank you. 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 Uh, the first one is regarding Lyon County Hilton, and let's do that. We've all received a confidential memo. Um, the reason we would like to do this is the first one, which is the uh, NBA. Building and the CEOs were issued as an apartment building. 
So conceivably, any apartment building could be converted to condo in the town. Right. Uh, what are the, so that's the record that you have now. What are the records that, what, what does the building record show in Portchester? Well, I'm pretty sure I've got the seal on the file because I checked all the, the the pieces that I could put together, and um, I believe it indicates that it's an apartment. Okay, I'm just. I mean, I'd be happy to. I support set. this, but I would just make sure that the that the that the record on file in Dorchester is the same record that you have. Okay. Motion and a second. So moved. I'll second. I'll second. <laughs> Council Person Jackson. Yes. Council Person Ari. Yes. Council Person Baxter. Yes. Council Person Boronello. Yes. Mr. Boronello. Yes. Um, Denise, is that your assessor's report or do you have something else? Not actually. Um, a couple of quick things. I went to the senior center in Ryan Brook this past Tuesday spoke to the seniors about exemptions and also a little bit about contesting their assessment. Um, I reached out to the villages of Port Chester and the Marinette to try to schedule something. I haven't heard back from them yet on a date. Um, my main focus to the seniors and just to, to announce here in case anybody will be watching this is May 1st is the deadline for all exemptions and renewals. That's a critical, critical date. We can help anybody figure out anything, but if they can just remember that date, that's the most important thing, because if they come in on May 2nd, we can't help them. Um, and uh, reminded them to check their tentative assessments on June 1st, and grievance day this year is June 20th. Um, one other thing is we are at the, on the final stage of approving the contract for a company known as I Look About to do the street level photography, and if everything falls into place, which it should within the next day or so, weather permitting, they're supposed to be starting that photography next week. The last thing is uh, I'm happy to report we're interviewing candidates for the real property appraiser position. Uh, we have a couple of very qualified candidates, and I'm hoping we'll be able to move forward with that soon. Right, do you want, Denise, do you want to talk about the mailer? You, uh, Denise is working with Debbie and the task force, the assessment task force, to put together a mailer, an informational mailer. Right. This, the task force met yesterday. Uh, the mailer, the text is pretty much complete. Part of the group is looking into the logistics of the mailing, and they're hoping it should go out um, by the first week in April. And it basically talks about what I spoke to the seniors about, uh, what is it, a little bit about what is an assessment, uh, the tentative roll date, grievance day, how to contest your assessment, and the May 1st exemption deadline. This is more in our effort to greater transparency and making the public aware of all the processes of the, uh, of the town. Um, Nick, do you have a report while you're standing there? Yes, just a few minutes, that's about that. Thanks. This is not the next one. I know, I know. I saw you standing there. We're getting a little closer to the back of the day. We're all getting older. Since when is 35 old? No, 42. Good evening, Mr. Supervisor and members of the town council. Folks at home, I heard you. Here comes that guy. <laughs> anyway, we're here now ready for the first bill of 2017. The first tax bill, the county and town, you should have it the first week of April. We're working now on finalizing all the figures. So please, if you don't get it by, let's say, April 10th, call the office and we're more than happy to mail you a copy. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Receiver. Um, we've done Crawford Park. Uh, okay, finance, anything? Nothing? Well, thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. very much for the birthday wishes. Yes. <laughs> Tell us about the event. The in rams um, I have to speak to Dan about it. I don't know what I'm going to Okay. I okay. uh, hope you have submitted your report. Anything new? Super.
Superintendent Powers has submitted his report. Um, comments from the council persons? Anybody want to? Anybody want to say anything, Lindsay? Yes, as a matter of fact, I do. <laughs> I just wanted to thank Denise um, for her work, especially going to the senior centers. Um, it's important for anyone who's ever done door to door, which I've done way too much <laughs> for way too many candidates. It's heartbreaking to see seniors who've lived in these homes for a year to raise their families in these homes and they're being taxed out. So anything, you know, they can do so give them the information they need and keep them in mind. It's, it's great to see. Thank you. Thank you. I would just take a moment to uh, congratulate everybody involved on the, uh, the progress made at Crawford um, that we heard so much about tonight. It's really exciting work. It's good to see that, that work has begun and that people can see progress for it. And I'd like to thank the council for their attention and um, due consideration for the Energizing New York program, which I think potentially can benefit and will benefit um, several commercial property owners in the town. So thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, first, uh, I also want to thank uh, the progress, uh, thank everybody's about the progress uh, with uh, Crawford Park and, and the vision that uh, is being realized and uh, to see the, the transition from one administration uh, to the other, administ the next administration and, uh, and really the, the pick up on that and, and the, uh, the intensity really is spectacular. And uh, Dave and Tom and many of us here, the one thing that I've always spoke of whenever we, we discuss spending money and projects and consultants and all of this were actionable items. And I can definitely say that uh, we've held true on, uh, on these actionable items. Uh, that it wasn't, we haven't spent any money uh, that was not realized. Uh, it's always been for some specific benefit to the taxpayers, so that, that's great. Um, on a light note, Gary, uh, I wish there were more people here to listen to this, but uh, Gary identified the absolute formula to fill a room at a town board meeting. You have to spend money and then send out invitations and then offer food and drink. So you, you did a great job tonight packing this room here. Good job, Gary, on that. Um, I have to hold hold some way with it. I don't think that is dead. That is dead. Especially with the food and drink. Very good. Um, I was able to give our restaurant a plug. Uh, yes, we gave our new restaurant a plug. Stormwater uh, reconnaissance project is uh, is I guess moving along. Uh, it's sitting right now with uh, with the county lawyers and uh, and Gary has been very diligent every Monday in pushing that process along over in White Plains and I appreciate that. Also want to thank Chris Bradbury for the effort that he's putting forward uh, on behalf of uh, this project. I know that we're going to go forward. And then lastly, uh, I want to uh, encourage everybody to vote uh, for the bond, school bond on Tuesday. Um, usually I don't, uh, you know, sit here, it's been 12 years, and ask people to vote a specific way. Um, but when we talk about the value created in everything that we do, Town of Rye is creating value for the community, for the residents, in making an investment in Crawford Park and the facilities. Um, and there's a direct correlation with the community. And in keeping with what uh, Mr. Nardi, Council Nardi, who mentioned, I believe that in making that investment in the school district and the facilities uh, is going to enhance and create value in the community, uh, value in the education system and uh, create value in the community. So please get out and vote in favor of that bond. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Um, I just want to thank everybody. Um, starting with my fellow council members, um, I think that we are on the same page with virtually everything that we're doing. It's my goal to try to be inclusive and to let everybody know what's on my mind. Um, I know that, that the council members are not down there every day uh, in the offices and in total communication um, with, uh, you know, with staff, etc. cetera. Um, but this is a joint effort. And um, I 
think it's an incumbent on me as the supervisor to bring everybody on board on what I'm thinking and directions that I want to go and let everybody know as much information as possible so that we can all make decisions together. And I think I've tried to do that and I think the council has responded and the presentation on Crawford Park is just one example of that, how we've brought everybody together. And that brings me into bringing the rest of the community in, not only the friends, the not-for-profits, people who have an interest, not only in the park, but everything that's happening in, in, in our government. Uh, and also to compliment the staff, who are doing a terrific job, top to bottom. All our department heads, our receiver, our assessor, our clerk, attorney, Davey, our controller, who sits there wondering about the numbers all the time. And of course, Debbie, who's, who's on top of everything. And uh, she's really making the, uh, she's really making the trains run on time. And, and we all appreciate that. So, uh, you know, I've enjoyed, I really haven't had a chance to say anything. I, I keep saying I'm going to make a state of the uh, town address, and I will someday. But I really enjoy all the camaraderie and the, and the feeling that we're all working to make this town a better place. All of us up here, all of us in the office, and the people that are not in the office, the people that are, that are outside the park, the parks, the, the contractors that we have. We have so many great contractors. I know John Zicka and, and, um, and uh, Westmore Electric. Um, pardon? John Greco. John Greco. You know, John, I love John. The name just flew out of my head. John Greco, John Zicka, everybody that works for the town and goes above and beyond. You know, you call them, they come. They do things. Sometimes they don't even charge. And that's the kind of spirit that we need. You know, I haven't heard anybody in the office complaining that, you know, there's too much, that there's, you know, that, uh, they're overburdened, and they get the job done. And it's really a pleasure to work with such a wonderful group of people. It really is. And I've, I've enjoyed my year a little bit here. And, um, and as again, my council is terrific. All well, you guys and me, absolutely wonderful. And I really feel that we're, we're making progress on all fronts. So that's my comment for today. Thank you. Motion to adjourn? So, so. Wait, <laughs> <laughs>